Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in for uh, some important updates on where we are in Colorado and the path ahead on coronavirus. Uh, after a 24-hour trip to Washington, D.C. to meet with the president, I am very glad to be back in Colorado. Uh, it was an interesting experience, to say the least, for anybody who's traveled recently, you've experienced that. But uh, people, of course, wearing masks on planes, being as safe as possible, but knowing the additional risk of being in an enclosed space. It was also interesting for me personally to be in Washington, D.C., a town that I commuted to for a number of years as a member of Congress when everything was shut down and so quiet. Um, unlike Colorado, they're still at the stay-at-home phase there, and really the streets are dead. What was normally bustling with activity, uh, people, and, and, and uh, they've had an increased um, risk in a, a, high, uh, a relatively high percentage, Northern Virginia, D.C., Maryland of uh, impact from coronavirus. So we got in, was tested, met with the president, talked about that the other day. Uh, and uh, it's important that we work with all our private sector partners, the federal government, anybody that we can to get the needed supplies we need in Colorado, masks and tests, making a lot of progress on those fronts. Uh, we also had a reflection point this week. Uh, we've lost over a thousand people here in Colorado to COVID-19. Uh, joining the hundreds of thousands across the world that have passed away from this deadly virus. Uh, and tragically, we also know that there's more that will succumb in the days ahead. But what we are doing today at 7 p.m., Coloradans across the state, uh, diverse geographically, politically, in every way, joined by dozens of cities and towns, is we're going to take a moment at 7 p.m., to remember those who we've lost. Every person we've lost in this horrible pandemic has a story and a community of loved ones in mourning. And it's been tough because for many families, they haven't been able to have those funerals, those celebrations of life that we normally have to honor those who've meant so much to us because those events themselves would have been very dangerous for those who attended them. And in addition, those who've passed away from COVID, largely in hospitals, were unable to even be visited by their loved ones in their final weeks um, because of the danger of going into a COVID ward. So it's been tough. And I know that all of us, myself included, on behalf of our state, want to express my condolences and our condolences to the tens of thousands of loved ones, families, and friends of the thousand people uh, that we've lost who weren't able to be visited in their final days and whom we weren't able to have proper in-person remembrances or wakes for. Um, so at 7 p.m. tonight, I ask everybody to simply put on, put on your mask uh, and just take a moment of silence or of prayer, if you prefer, uh, for all of the victims uh, of Corona-19 in Colorado and indeed across the world. Um, and we are making these changes in our everyday lives. We're avoiding social interactions where we can. We're being smart about how we live. We're wearing masks when we're in public uh, to make sure that less families have to go through the great loss uh, that too many families in Colorado uh, have had to undergo. And we join in mourning tonight for them. The state capitol will be lit up in red tonight. Many municipal buildings across the state will be as well. And for those who have suffered loss, uh, this is really Colorado coming together to support you uh, in your time of grief. When we can't to come together physically, we're coming together on our own with our very powerful moments of silence or prayer uh, to remember the loss that you've had. Um, the state is encouraging buildings and businesses to turn their lights red if they can, if they're set up for that at 7 p.m. Police and fire departments, many of them will be turning their lights on at 7 p.m for one minute. And on the individual level, many Coloradans will be having a moment of silence at 7 p.m. for the over 1,000 victims in our state. And it's also important to remember that every number has a name. Uh, it's easy to say over 1,000 people, each one of those is a person with friends, with family, with loved ones. And let's all take a moment this evening to reflect on those we've lost, if you're fortunate enough not to have known anybody who suffered loss, 
uh, say a prayer, observe that moment for your fellow Coloradans, your fellow humans across the world, and remember why we all need to do our part. Today, Friday, May 15th, is also Peace Officers Memorial Day, which the state will commemorate by lowering flags to half-mast. And we encourage all Coloradans to commemorate those in law enforcement as well. We know that our members of law enforcement, our first responders, are at additional risk to coronavirus because of the everyday work they do with the general public. And we're making every effort to keep our first responders safe. But during the pandemic, we're even more thankful to our first responders for putting their lives on the line to protect public health and protect our safety. I also want to thank our wonderful workforce who work at senior care facilities. We talk a lot about our doctors and nurses, but we often don't talk enough about those who work in nursing homes and other senior care facilities, putting themselves at risk. Uh, the facilities and the residents are at great risk. Uh, we're working hard to increase the personal protection equipment supplies and have begun in a number of places the testing of asymptomatic, that means healthy workers, to screen out those who might be contagious without knowing it so they don't lead to greater uh, infection. And I want to thank them as well. Uh, two more announcements before we get into questions. First, I want to highlight uh, the advocacy work we're doing uh, along with governors, Republican and Democrat, in a number of states that have ski resorts uh, so that they can better access relief funds under Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, because of the seasonal nature of the industry, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program didn't work for our ski resorts. We want our ski resorts to be there in full force for next season. Uh, if the numbers hold up, very few that have snow might be able to open in a limited way in June. But we really want to be there for next fall and next winter. And I really encourage the federal government, working with the Republican and Democratic governors who live in states fortunate enough to have skiing, none of them have as great skiing as Colorado, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, Congress changes the Paycheck Protection Program so ski resorts with the nature of their seasonal workforce can be eligible, can stay in business, can stay viable, and are healthy to open next year. I also want to give a special shout out to the Betcher Foundation, which has approved over a million dollars in biomedical research grants, CU, CSU, Children's Hospital, National Jewish, uh, as well as the uh, COVID relief fund, HelpColoradoNow.org, which is getting immediate support work out to help those who are most in need. Despite, despite all the tragedy around us, um, those who have been hospitalized, those whose lives we lost, the economic devastation globally of this virus. What gives me hope is that doctors and scientists in our own backyard and across the world are doing the hard work to find a cure, to find a vaccine, to find a way to mitigate the, impact, mitigate the impacts of this deadly virus so we can get back to, to normal. And at 7 p.m. this evening, as we remember those we've lost, let's also reflect on the path ahead the individual responsible choices that we're making as Coloradans to avoid social contact where we can, stay six feet from others, wash our hands regularly, wear masks when we're in public. Uh, the more that we do that, uh, the more responsible we are, uh, the more lives we'll save, and the shorter the duration of the economic uh, distortion will be, and the sooner that uh, we can get back to a sustainable sense of normal, normalcy. Uh, and we can look towards the future with hope, with determination, when we raise our heads from our moment of silence or prayer, we can look with new eyes upon a future in which we will continue to show justified caution, not fear, not anxiety, but we wanna be smart, and I know Coloradans are, we wanna be cautious to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our families, and together we'll come out on the other side even stronger. With that, we'll be happy to take some questions. <laughs> not the time for politicking. Uh, uh, I work closely with our federal delegation, with Senator Bennett, with Senator Gardner. Our federal delegation has risen to the occasion, has been very responsive. Uh, it's not the time to talk about political credit or, uh, or to make political hay over Coloradans who are doing their job and uh, our Republican and Democratic elected officials by and large have been very responsible in doing their jobs on behalf of the people uh, of Colorado. 
Um, as governor, uh, of course, I've been very strong in advocating for the COVID-19 uh, relief fund. Uh, there's been the Broncos, uh, many other organizations have stepped up. I continue, and I've spent uh, a lot of time working with thank donors and showing appreciation for all of the work that they're doing. Uh, I serve, of course, in the public capacity uh, in this, and it's very important that I do everything I can as governor to get the resources to where they're needed most. <laughs> Republican State Representative Mark Baisley is calling for criminal charges against your state public health director, Jill Ryan, for falsifying death certificates to inflate COVID-19 numbers. I have a couple of questions about that. One, is the state falsifying death certificates to inflate COVID-19 deaths? And what do you think about the rhetoric that's suggesting that? Well, the rhetoric is very Obviously, the consideration of criminal charges is completely inappropriate. Um, I, like many Coloradans, was very upset when I read last week about a case where the doctors thought somebody didn't die of COVID, but somehow they were classified of it. There was another case this week. I've told the Department of Health to make sure they're very clear in their reporting. Uh, nobody behind a desk should ever second guess a coroner or an attending physician that lists a cause of death on a, on a certificate. Now, the department, which we'll have a briefing later today on this, will tell you they have to report that higher number to the CDC. They have to report under federal guidelines, uh, this is what they tell me, uh, the number that have had COVID and died. But we also should make public the people that died from COVID. And I'm gonna make sure that they do that in a way that engenders the full confidence and support of the people of Colorado. Uh, of course, criminal charges are completely inappropriate. Uh, I have joined in asking the department to make sure that we report to the public the people that died from COVID-19. If they need to make a separate report to CDC, they can. But what the people of Colorado wanna know is not who died with COVID-19, uh, but who died of COVID-19. Um, and the numbers are very close, of course. There's only a few cases that uh, they're aware of uh, where there's some gray area. But when there is gray area, uh, we should always uh, use for reporting the numbers that come from the physician or the coroner that actually addressed the patient or, or inspected the body, uh, not somebody ever second guessing it from behind a desk. <laughs> that that person died with COVID-19. That doesn't mean that person died of COVID-19. The more important number for the people of Colorado, the number that I've told, that the, I've told the department uh, uh, since I first found out about a similar incident a week or two ago, is they need to report to the people of Colorado how many people died of COVID-19. People are not very interested in, nor should they be, how many people died with COVID-19. If the CDC needs it, they need to do it. They need to follow the law. But the number for the people of Colorado needs to be who has died of COVID-19. Uh, and I'm confident that their leadership will do their best to provide that number to the people of Colorado uh, on a daily basis. You've used the term pro-choice in the past to describe your stance on vaccines. Obviously, we don't know when one might become available here. Uh, but do you still describe yourself that way, particularly in this context? If there's a vaccine that becomes available We are eager for a vaccine. There's several clinical trials going on. There's actually research teams at CSU and Anschutz uh, that are working on vaccines. Hundreds of research teams across the world. Uh, the issue will be, once we have a vaccine, how could we even gear up production quick enough to make it available? And who do we prioritize it for? Uh, it'll likely be prioritized for those who are at highest risk from the virus first, uh, even under some of the most ambitious models where we have a vaccine by fall, uh, which we hope by winter, it, the production would only likely be in the tens of millions in those first few months. To make the hundreds of millions and billions of vaccines necessary, even after one is created, could take an additional year after the vaccine is established. So uh, there are gonna be so much demand for this vaccine. Every Colorado I know is going to be lining up for it. Uh, the limited supply will mean that we likely need to prioritize Coloradans who are most at risk for the limited number of vaccinations when they become available. Hi, Governor. This is Kyle Clark with Nine News. Your Department of Corrections confirmed today that last month, acting on your executive order, it released inmate Cornelius Haney early and placed him on special parole. 
This weekend, Denver police say that he murdered a 21 year old woman. What are your thoughts on that and on his release? So that uh, particular inmate has been eligible for, for parole since 2017, and he would have had mandatory parole granted uh, August of, of this year. Uh, nobody should be released simply because of COVID-19. Uh, of course, the parole board in making the individual evaluations, and that is a tough job that they do. Again, they couldn't have held that person much longer than they did. Uh, he had been up for parole since 2017. But of course, in, in making those decisions, they are taking into account the safety of prison guards uh, and others. But no prisoner who is a danger to society should be released early in any situation. And of course, uh, nobody on that parole board thought that this person was going to do what they allegedly did. But they couldn't have held him much longer under the law. He had to be released by August. I'm glad that they didn't release him in 2017 when he first came up from parole. Uh, but being on the parole board is a tough job. We respect the people who make those decisions every day. They're doing their best to make the best informed decisions they can to keep Coloradans safe uh, as they decide uh, within the legal parameters they have the conditions of parole for people who've served their term. Hello, Governor. This is Vinny Del Judice at Bloomberg News in Denver. A finance question today. Has Colorado determined if it's eligible for the Federal Reserve Special Lending Facility for state and local governments? If so, will it apply? And is legislative approval required by Colorado law to sell short-term debt to the Fed? Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll have to get back to you on that because it's more of a legal question. We don't have an announcement today about reaching an agreement to participate. Um, as for the eligibility and the course of action, uh, if Colorado to participate, we'll, we'll be happy to get you an answer. Hi, Governor. This is Kara Mason from The Sentinel. Um, earlier this week, while in Washington, you said the administration and Dr. Burks were complimentary of what Colorado is doing in regards to contact tracing. Can you expand on that and what resources Colorado needs to achieve successful contact tracing? Yeah, and, and let me first go back to uh, Mar one of Mary Ann's questions earlier, and then I'll get to the contact question. Um, she asked about the COVID relief fund. Um, I will be donating uh, my entire salary from the date of the emergency declaration uh, until the emergency ends to the COVID-19 relief fund. So I wanted to make sure that Marianne knew that. Um, yeah, Dr. Burks was very complimentary of Colorado's work in tracking and tracing our plans for the future, the fact that we've doubled our number of epidemiologists, uh, the increase in testing that we're doing in partnership with the private suppliers and in partnership with the federal government. So both Jill Ryan and I had a, a side conversation with Dr. Burks. Uh, before the president was in the room for several minutes, and we also engaged her in the group uh, in, in, after the, uh, the press left. Uh, I have great respect for Dr. Burks, her immunological work in Africa and other areas, and uh, we value her advice. And I let her know, and we had had several phone calls with her and Jill Ryan and myself in the past. I said, let's continue to talk, because any advice you have about how we can optimize and improve uh, our program here in Colorado, we want to make sure we work with you to have the very best practices. I did think that the day that you said that all Colorado tourists are dramatic and be able to get the test, or at least you hope so. And then you said hopefully 5,000 tests per day, five today. How do you reach that goal, and what has changed since we last had a conversation about how uh, basic Coloradans who are symptomatic uh, can, can get tested. We have 32 free community testing sites uh, all over Colorado. There's a map at covid19.colorado.gov. That's in addition to hospitals and doctors. That's usually that first route. Uh, you're symptomatic, you call your doctor, you call your hospital. If for some reason you can't get a test that way, uh, we have a community testing site near you. 32 of them, we hope to have even more in the near future, but they're positioned across the state in a way that's free, they're accessible. Uh, if, you, if you have those symptoms, you can get tested. And uh, first, you, if you have a doctor, if you have a ho you, you go through your doctor, but if you can't get it that way, if you don't have a doctor, if they won't give it to you, if uh, you're too far from it, the community testing is a great route to go. And if people do have those flu-like symptoms, and I would add that because of the social distancing, the people with the normal colds and flu has gone down. So less people have these symptoms, which also means that a higher percentage of those who have these symptoms might mean it is in fact COVID-19 because the other conditions have decreased considerably as well because of the social distancing. So yes, if you're symptomatic, uh, you can get tested. Uh, it'll be important that we know early about the levels of COVID-19 in your neighborhood, in your community. Yesterday, your administration released the report 
about mobility with a lot of detailed mobility data analyzed. Um, two things stuck out. One, the most change was made by Coloradans in the two weeks prior to the stay-at-home work. So have you seen that, and did that help you make a decision about what to do with that stay-at-home order? Yeah. And second, uh, it looks like Coloradans began trending back toward normal after about April 15th. Are we at the level that we described around the end of April that we were targeting? now for the distancing. Yes, the confidence that I have in the people of Colorado to make smart decisions absolutely factored into my decision to end the stay-at-home order, to reopen stores, offices, so people could get back to work, because people are being responsible. Uh, and, and as long as they continue to be responsible, we should continue to have a better and better trajectory. What does responsibility mean? The mobility data is part of it, but it's not the whole picture. Because even while people are going to work, shopping, etc. As long as they're succeeding in staying six feet from others where they can, wearing masks when they're in stores, when they're in public, uh, we should be able to reach those goals. That's the reason that we're not able to make the full decision statewide on restaurants till the 25th, because we need the data from the intervening 10 days to see, in fact, whether the mobility data is borne out, that people are, in fact, being smart and exercising responsibility. I have great confidence in the people of Colorado. That's the only way that we can get through this. It's not about any local order, state order. Uh, it's about people caring about themselves, their loved ones, their families. You know what? Coloradans do. Uh, and by and large, uh, we're making responsible decisions to stay six feet away from others where we can, to minimize and reduce our social interactions, and to wear masks in public along with good hygiene, washing your hands for 20 seconds after you go out. Uh, that is going to be the ticket to saving lives in Colorado and getting back to as close to normal as soon as we can. This is Benta Brooklyn with Colorado Public Radio. Um, two quick questions here. How many tests are we doing today and where do you want to be? And then separately, you were just in Washington, D.C. with the president. Did you advocate for more flexible federal money for states? And what was the president's response? Uh, so it depends on the day. It could be at 4,000, 5,000, um, as many as are needed. Uh, we have the ability to go up to 8,500 or even 10,000 a day. Uh, we have the supplies in hand. We have the community testing center. So the day, there'll be day-to-day -day fluctuations, but I think we'll be in the five to 10,000 range uh, for most of the month of May uh, at our 32 community testing sites, as well as our private testing partners uh, through the hospitals and network of, of doctors. Uh, the president uh, and Governor Bergen from North Dakota brought this up, and we did talk about federal support. The president talked about how excited he was to borrow money at a very low interest rate. He said it's basically free money for the federal government. He then expressed his hopes that we would be in an environment with negative interest rates, where people would pay the federal government to borrow money. Um, again, it's not my personal view that that's desirable. I would be worried if we were in an ongoing situation with negative interest rates. That would be a significant economic drain because it would drain capital out of the private sector to the government. But he expressed his excitement about that. He even indicated that he dreamed his whole life about negative interest rates. Remember, he built his business empire based on debt. That's understandable. I based mine, I raised rose my business success based on equity, never debt. He did his based on debt. So it's just different perspectives. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. But he likes debt. Uh, he wants to borrow. He loves low interest rates. He would love negative interest rates. Um, I guess we agree that low interest rates are certainly better than high interest rates for financing debt. Uh, and we did discuss uh, a lot of that work. Um, what are your thoughts on the legislature's proposed pandemic precautions for reopening the state capitol? And more specifically, what are your concerns about those precautions being recommendations, including asking people with fevers to stay home, um, rather than mandatory? Uh, well, I have not looked at those, so I just, I just can't, I can't comment on them because they're not something that came from us. Um, would be happy to, to, take, to look at them. But I, I would say uh, it, it's legislative prerogative how they meet. I hope that Republican and Democratic legislators care about uh, the health of their fellow members, uh, care about the health of others who might be part of those proceedings, the staff that, that work there, members of the general public that participate. But I've not seen those guidelines. I want to follow up just on my last question because I was not clear on the answer. Would you still use the word 
the term pro-choice to describe yourself on vaccines. Has this virus experience changed uh, your outlook on this topic? Well, I mean, the, 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 you see, the problem, Alex, is going to be there's not enough vaccines for the people that, that want them. Uh, we all want vaccines. Um, if the, li the, the line is going to be so big to get vaccines, it's not the question. Uh, maybe there's a few Coloradans that don't want vaccines. I, I don't know. But there will not be enough vaccines for the people that desperately want them. So they will have to be prioritized. Uh, we haven't come up with a plan for this yet, but in, in our thinking, it would likely be for those who are most vulnerable to the virus would likely be prioritized first for the very limited number of vaccines that we would have early on. Hello, Governor. I'm Jesus Carrasquel from Noticias Univision. Por favor, en español, eh, Gobernador, finaliza la tercera semana de la fase más seguro en casa, pero ¿cuándo, ¿cuándo podrán los restaurantes y los negocios abrir al público y se le exigirá algo adicional? Sí. Um, estamos uh, mirando uh, la información sobre la condición de salud de Colorado cada día durante esta apoyo en su casa fase. Y vamos a decidir en una semana cuándo uh, puede abrir los restaurantes. Aquí en Colorado, uh, la mayoría de los negocios son, ya están abiertos. Por ejemplo, tiendas, por ejemplo, oficinas, todo está uh, abierto. Hay solamente algunos negocios sociales, como restaurantes y clubes, que todavía están cerrados. Y voy a decidir. ¿Cómo puedo abrirlo? ¿Cuándo? ¿Cómo? Uh, ¿Qué son las protecciones en la próxima semana? Todo el Estado los queremos más rápido, yo sé, pero también no, que, no, no uh, queremos más infección de virus también, porque ya, uh, ya tenemos un mil uh, personas perdidas de este virus. Y yo sé que vamos a tener más, pero no quiero muchos más miles. One more from the room. From the phone. Governor, this is Megan Lopez with Denver 7. On, um, on, on CNN recently, you had said that FEMA had taken over some of your contracts for PPEs. We just did an interview with the uh, FEMA administrator who vehemently denied ever doing this in any circumstances and not only said that he vehemently de denied that, but that anybody that thinks that something like this is being diverted to Freeman needs to report it because they have the DOJ working on it. I'm wondering if you can respond uh, to that. Uh, well, I didn't hear the comments. Uh, obviously, I would be thrilled if the DOJ is looking at uh, federal interdiction of state purchasing efforts. Uh, we've had to compete against all kinds of buyers um, for mass, for tests. We've competed against other states. We compete against our own federal government. We compete against foreign governments. Uh, I wish we had a better strategy from the start about working together as a nation, meaning the states and the federal government. But yes, we've had to compete against all kinds of buyers, public and private, domestic and international, including the federal government. And I would welcome any uh, investigation into DOJ, into any potential malfeasance. Uh, thank you all. At 7 o'clock today, we will all be donning our mas masks, taking a moment of silence for respect for those who we've lost, for those we were unable to say goodbye to, uh, and we will raise our heads and look forward to acting smart, acting with informed caution, and continue, continuing to be vigilant uh, to help maintain our health, economic, and our uh, biological health. Thank you. Pueblo, Colorado, from old Rockies paraphernalia. Uh, it is certainly my hope as a baseball fan that Major League Baseball will be back. I encourage the players and the owners to negotiate a reasonable way that allows them to get back to America's pastime on television in a safe way. But in the meantime, I'm proud to uh, highlight the work that volunteers in Pueblo have done with old Rockies paraphernalia, making it in a mass to show our support for Purple Nation. Thank you.